Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We're, go we're going to get started today. It's just so great to hear so many voices here because uh, over the summer, those, that hallway has been so quiet. So it's just been wonderful to hear uh, the enthusiasm, excitement in your voices. And it's just, just wonderful. Uh, my name is Stephen Kavanagh, and I'm the uh, uh, Dean of the Betty R. M. Moore School of Nursing here. And it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome you here today and to celebrate this milestone in your journey to becoming excellent healthcare providers. And also at the same time to welcome families, friends and supporters, hundreds of them I'm anticipating, who are on Facebook Live this afternoon. And I'm gonna to wave to them all because you can't at the moment. All those people out there, welcome for joining us today. And I hope you have an outstanding time watching your, your folks here be white coated. I know that uh, you'd originally planned to, to do uh, this last year. Uh, when you arrived at the school, uh, but a certain pandemic got in the way. Uh, so we do thank you for your patience uh, and your tenacity to forward ahead in your dreams of becoming the best PA, the best nurse practitioner that you can be. We saw it before you joined the school, and we know that you can be excellent clinicians and leaders and really make a huge difference to our healthcare system. We share with you your aspirations to make a difference to the lives of individuals, families, and all those that you care for in a compassionate way. You are now part of a community dedicated all the time to support students, faculty, your patients, your colleagues, as you move together to make optimal health a goal for everyone. From the first day, uh, we've challenged you to commit yourself to improving the care of people you serve, as well as learning to improve it. For the past year, you've been developing the skills to lead in the future settings, community, in hospitals, and wherever care is being divided, uh, provided, because as you may know, uh, these days, NPs and PAs uh, can be working in so many different environments, some that you might not have even dreamed or heard of yet. And so to, part of it is your imagination, your dreams to be fulfilled. I know now the exciting part for you is that you're embarking upon uh, clinical rotations, where you will put all your didactic knowledge into practice. And I happen to know, have a quick call, uh, chat with Dr. Pearl, that you are now experts in anatomy, those PAs, okay? So you know which end is which, I hope. Um, just in time uh, for you meeting your patients and your clients uh, in the near future. Uh, and I'm so delighted uh, that we could be gathering to get today to mark this transition. For many of you, of course, uh, some of you have seen each other for the first time, uh, other than just boxes. Some of you may know each other, but this is a time really to build community, to work and support each other through your studies. Uh, tonight reminds us that even though we have maybe not shared the same classroom and lab space, we are all serving people together. I hope this event, you'll take some important things to reflect upon. Um, we're looking forward to find out where you're going, where your journey will be, where all the teaching and learning and experiences will take you. That's important for your careers. It's also very important to us. We want to hear what motivates you. What sort of clients are you interested in? How can you improve care? And obviously, of course, how you're adjusting to what the new emerging world is going to be of clinical practice and where that practice is. Our goal is for you to continue to master academic content and feed your intellect. We will continue to build your capacity to work with others, to lead others, to persevere when it gets tough, but also to nurture your spirit and your passion. That's so important. Uh, I look forward to seeing how you put your passion into practice, how you serve individuals, families, and communities here in California and el elsewhere. Uh, and as I've said to other, other groups, it's so important, uh, probably at no time in our history uh, do we need leaders such as yourself to change what we're doing, to improve care, to think about different ways of doing it. And this is what this school is all about, expert practice, but system change. We look to you to make it better, one patient at a time. Uh, and at this point, uh, it's my pleasure to hand over to uh, Jeff Pearl, uh, our PA director, to share some thoughts, wisdom, and other things. Dr. Pearl, thank you.
didn't turn the pages. That's good. Well, thank you, Dean Kavanaugh. Today we celebrate your entry into healthcare with a white coat ceremony. Although the ceremony itself is relatively recent, the symbolism of the white coat in medicine dates back over a century. Before physicians dressed in white coats, most physicians in the Western world actually dressed in black. In fact, until the 1800s, physicians in this country uh, wore black formal wear, such as a modern day tuxedo. There was a famous painting by Thomas Eakins called The Gross Clinic in 1875, which showed Philadelphia surgeons in black attire performing surgery. Physicians wore black for their patient interactions, since back then medical encounters were thought of as a very serious and formal matter. Clergymen also dressed in black, which indicated the solemn nature of their role in encounters with parishioners. An additional alternative explanation for the dark garb that was worn by physicians in the late 19th century was that back then seeking medical advice was usually a last resort and frequently a precursor to death. Until the last third of the 1800s, an encounter with a physician was often of little or no benefit. In fact, up to that point, virtually all of medicine entailed many worthless cures and much quackery. And about the same time as that occurred, the idea of antisepsis was taking hold in Europe. It was Joseph Lister's contribution that truly moved medicine from home remedies and quackery to the realm of bioscience. For the first time, reproducible results helped researchers better understand how to prevent bacterial contamination, which of course was one of the major causes of death back in the 1800s. Remarkably, this progression was documented by Eakins again in 1889 with an operating theater masterpiece, the Agnew Clinic from the University of Pennsylvania, where it shows Dr. Agnew seen in a white smock with his assistants, also wearing white, suggesting that a new sense of cleanliness pervaded the environment. The patient is swathed in white sheets as well, and the nurse has a white cap on. This fostered an image of doctors being clean and sanitary in their white attire, a far cry from the snake oil, charla snake oil charlatans with bogus cures in the Victorian era. Shortly after the Agnew painting, the Flexner Report in 1910 led to the closure of a large number of borderline medical institutions and restructuring of medical education around laboratory science rather than non-science. Coupled with uh, Dr. Osler's famous textbook in 1892 about the value of cleanliness and antisepsis, this was a, now became a firmly fixed component of medical science as part of medical care. At the end of the 19th and 20th century, when medicine became based on science, the pureness of medicine became reflected in the garb of physicians and nurses. Up until that time, nuns in their black habits functioned as nurses. At the turn of the 19th century, the black habits of the religious nursing order also became white. In fact, to this day, as you may or may not know, many nurses in England are still called sisters because of the origin um, coming out of the nun, nunnery in terms of the nursing uh, field. As medical students adopted a more rigorous and standardized curriculum based on science, historians believe that licensed physicians embraced the white coat to really differentiate themselves from the doctors without formal credentials, didn't really need to even get licensed back in the 1800s, uh, and from the homeopathic practitioners and the cracks that were just peddling uh, potions uh, out on the street. In 1915, all licensed physicians in the United States pretty much started wearing white coats to differentiate themselves. Now, the white coat ceremony started uh, in 1993, actually, not that long ago. In fact, my mom asked me when I was coming here last week for the um, ceremony, uh, I don't remember going to your white coat. And I'm like, that's because I'm too old. And we didn't have one back when I went to med school, because we didn't. And I thought about it. And it really was in about 1993 at Columbia University College of Medicine um, that this was started. Now, some say it was about eight, 1989, there was a ceremony at University of Chicago, but he didn't publish on it. so the the, the uh, person in 1993 at Columbia got credit for it. And that was Dr. Gold. And he initiated the practice because he believed that medical students should recognize the profession's standards and responsibilities before they begin formal training. He said students should declare their commitment and accept their obligation to the profession before starting their training. The tradition has expanded to a variety of other health professions, obviously, such as pharmacy, optometry, physical therapy, veterinary medicine, and of course, physician assistant and nurse practitioner in advanced practice nursing. And it's now actually celebrated not just in the United States, but internationally at medical schools and other uh, advanced practice schools throughout the world. 
We use this ceremony really as an opportunity to underscore those responsibilities and your commitment to care for the patients that you come in contact over the span of your career. Many patients now view the white coat as a cloak of compassion and the expectations that they have when they come see a provider wearing a white coat, a symbol of caring and hope and that they expect to receive from their healthcare provider, no longer a sign a precursor of death or something ominous. In addition, as you know, the way that you interact as a patient with your provider and as a provider with your patient has also changed. It's no longer a one-dimensional, you're the provider, the patient doesn't have a role. It's now a team effort between you and your patient. That has also changed as we've developed uh, into wearing white coats and changing that relationship. Just as importantly, um, so PA schools give students, obviously, the scientific and clinical tools to become PAs. But just as importantly, the white coat symbolizes the other critical part of a student's medical education, a standard of professionalism and caring, and an emblem of the trust they must earn from their patients. The white coat ceremony welcomes students embarking on their medical careers, giving them the powerful symbol of compassion and honor. It also gives you a standard against which you must measure your every act of care for your patients and the trust that they put in you. I congratulate all of you on this important transition in your education. And I think, although you voted last year to postpone this rather than doing it on Zoom, which was great, and I think that was a great decision, hoping that we'd be able to do it in person, and we have, still with masks, but other than that. Um, and I think as you're, even though you've been wearing these in lab, I hope you look at these when you put them on every day starting next week and go to clinic, of what that really represents as you approach every patient every opportunity that you're given during this year and make the most out of it. And just reflect back during the hard times when you're busy working a lot, that that's a privilege to put that coat on and what it represents. As you start your clinicals next week, we thought you might like the perspective of someone who has been in your shoes a few years ago, a member of the graduating class of 2019 to shed some light on that. And that would be Kimya Igani. So if Kimya, you wanna come up and say a few words, that would be great. Thank you. Pages here. Thank you, Dr. Pearl, for introducing me. Thank you, faculty and staff, for being here today. Class of 2022. Wow, you guys are here. You made it. I will tell you right now, it's unfortunate we couldn't do it last year, but I'm really glad that we're here today to kind of acknowledge all of your accomplishments thus far. I started my first job in 2019 at a primary care clinic in Folsom, California. It was a beautiful facility, the staff was great, friendly, so sweet, and uh, checked all those boxes of a perfect new site for a gr new grad. About a month and a half in, I stopped getting paid. I actually was not receiving any paychecks, I was essentially working for free. I came to find out, don't do that, just FYI. <laughs> I came to find out that the boss that I had made some poor financial decisions that I I didn't get to hear about it until a month and a half in. Fortunately, that was not the only bad news. It came to my attention that he started bailing on clinic, not you know having any reason, and my patient load was increasing. As a new grad, as you'll see, that's really daunting. Basically what happened was I was kind of stuck at a crossroad. Why would I stay there, right? I was, working for, uh, I was working towards my doctorate degree at the time, and I required clinical hours that I'd set up with this clinic, and I needed an attending physician to sign off. Unfortunately, that provider did lose their medical license, and I was forced to find a new job ASAP. Otherwise, I couldn't finish my doctorate program. And of course, this all happened in 2020, the best year that we're ever going to experience in our lives. I say this story not to alarm you. I mean, obviously, I'm here today. The program did its job. Hey, Dr. Pearl. <laughs> but I say this because I want to shine light on a very specific phrase and statement that resonated with me through that time, but throughout my whole life. The phrase isn't Farsi or Persian. The phrase is tahamolkon. A tahamolkon means to endure through the, through the pain or a temporary moment that is uncomfortable, a struggle, in the hopes of something greater. 
endure through the midst of pain for that greater goal. You guys have finished clinical year. Let's clap. This is awesome. Okay? Imposter syndrome doesn't count anymore. It's gone. You guys have done it. You've passed your exams. You're heading into your rotations. You're heading into your clinical sites to actually practice what you have learned up until now. The main thing I want to leave with you is this idea of tahamolkon, endure in those moments. You'll see when you get out to rotations, there's going to be nights you probably will just be crying for no reason. You just will be. You're probably going to consume a lot of Taco Bell and Domino's pizza by yourself. You're going to wake up one day and not want to go to that clinical site. But I challenge you, tahamolkon, endure through those moments for that greater goal. It's not going to be forever. It's just going to be temporary, similar to your clinical year that now is in the past. Look at you all sitting here today. You've made it to your white coat ceremony. You've been doing this idea already. And I'm just up here to further echo that idea of this tahamolkon. You're going to see patients that they're going to be, you know, hey, I see your finger is sliced open. I can only numb you so much, but can you please just endure simple sewing or this poke just for that moment to have relief long term. I urge you to stay on this course. Use your resources, use your friends, use your family, but you yourself are that resource. You yourself can tahamolkan, and if you do, you will have that opportunity to really be an impact in patients and others' lives. So if I could leave you with anything, remember this phrase. Taha Molkon, endure in the midst of those temporary moments for that greater goal, for that PA degree, for that NP degree, for whatever potential greatness you can achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Kimya. I'd like, I'd like now to invite the PA faculty Nitsa Sebat and Kara Sandholt to join me on stage for the coding. They'll be reading the names while I put your coats on. If you're tall, please bend down a little bit. <laughs> Sierra Arnott. Christine Babayan. <laughs> Puya Bage. Justine Blyde. Delaney Cantrell. Helen Chang. Brian Clark. Caitlin Consul. Cody Dam. Austin Davis Hunter. Veselina Doncheva.
Emery Ganzon. Maria Elisa Garcia. Mallory Fleischer. Jared Gorder. Mara Hall. Tony Ho. Kingsley Hui. Claire Jennings Bledsoe. David Jones. Lacey Cap. Alan Lee. Samantha Lilla Kiesling. Lee Lore. Haley Martin. Sarah Matty. Rachel McAvee. Thank you. Now, Kara Sandholt will read the rest of the cohort's names. Michaela Morris. Brian Newton. <laughs> Philip Wen. <laughs> Rachel Nguyen. Halani Nigo. Jacqueline Olympias. Cheyenne Quach.
Olivia Gabrielle Quijano. Jocelyn Ramirez. Monica Ramirez Cisneros. Eugenia Rodriguez. Morgan Rury. Marjan Samimi. Kiana Sanchez. Rick Shulkin. Sandra Solomon. Jeanette Tan. Bayana Tasfe. Emma Toulson. Sonia Torres. Diana Tran. <laughs> Hannah Foy Tran. <laughs> Irene Turner. Taggart Venegas. <laughs> Catherine Vo. <laughs> Brittany Vollmer. Renee Wadsworth. Kate Wright. Congratulations to our PA students. I now invite Dr. Katherine Sexton to the podium. Just gonna bend this way down here. <laughs> so congratulations to all of our PA students and the next 12 months ahead, and to our FNP students embarking on your own nine-month journey to becoming FNPs. I'm Katherine Sexton, Program Director 
for the Family Nurse Practitioner Program. Dr. Pearl spoke to you about how we prepare you to be excellent clinicians and the meaning behind the white coats you received tonight and the symbol of the solemn promise that you're now making to yourselves and to the patients you are going to care for. I want to focus on the core values that we believe are critical to ensuring your success in our constantly evolving and increasingly diverse world of healthcare. Here at the School of Nursing, we promote health equity and high quality healthcare through innovative research, education, clinical practice, and health policy guided by our core values. The first of which is community connection, where action is created with and relevant to our local, regional, and global communities. Next is diversity and inclusion, in which the voices and perspectives of people from diverse backgrounds and experiences are affirmed and included to achieve health and healthcare equity. The third core value is leadership. Here are the essential skills and abilities needed to affect change are emphasized for researchers, educators, and you, the clinicians. The fourth core value is innovative solutions, where technology and data science are leveraged to advance research, enhance education, and improve the clinical practice that we share with our patients. And finally, recognizing collaboration. It is the interdisciplinary and interprofessional patient and community partnerships that are necessary to strengthen the quality of research, education, clinical practice, and health policy. In all of these areas, each of you has important and valuable contributions to make as students now and later as graduates. In his book, Winning the Long Game, author Steve Krupp writes, leadership is by definition about getting people on board to achieve a shared goal. We have a shared goal to improve how healthcare is delivered and how people receive that care. Experience shows us that by encountering and interacting with individuals from a variety of backgrounds during their training, health professionals are better able to serve the nation's diverse society. Here you will learn in an interprofessional environment and leave having broadened perspectives of racial, ethnic, cultural, and healthcare team members' similarities and differences. Amid all of that, we want you to remember balance. Ensuring you are taking time for yourself and the people important in your life because it becomes increasingly more difficult to set priorities or to allot time and energy as your studies progress. Without balance, this may lead to getting caught up in the short game. Your professional journey is about to change. Don't lose sight of the big picture. And as Dr. Pearl said, play the long game. As faculty, we think we have a pretty good idea of the road ahead of you. We've walked in your shoes, and no matter how many years, we all remember. But those who have walked that road have unique insight into this next phase of your education. And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome David Wilson, a graduate of the class of 2020, to share some thoughts with you. Let's back up a little bit, shall we? Thank you, Dr. Sexton, for that introduction. Uh, like you said, my name is David Wilson, and I graduated the class of 2020 um, in the FMP cohort. And uh, I wanted to come here and just speak about my educational experience and share that with you guys. I sat where you were not that long ago. It personally feels like a lifetime since uh, the transformation is exponential once you finish your clinical year and start your first year of practice. 
Um, currently, since I finished uh, the program here, I've been working at uh, UC Davis, just right across the street. I applied for the Trauma Fellowship Program, which has been incredible, and I would encourage all of you to look for a similar program in your first year of practice, just to have that extra guidance to help build that clinical confidence um, that is so crucial for our new providers. Um, but this is a different, different time for you guys. Normally, we do the white coat ceremony at the very, sorry, let me take this off so you see my face. At the very beginning of the ceremony, I'm glad you deferred to have it now, and I'm honored to be part of this experience for you. Um, things I wanted to talk about, what to expect going into your clinical year, it's going to be different, obviously. You just finished that first year didactic, intense classroom session. I mean, I remember it like just walking through these halls, nostalgia hit me real hard. I didn't really miss all the studying, but I do miss this environment. I can feel it and sense there's so much learning going on here, and I can see it in all your eyes. Just that bright light, just ready to go out there and do some good. So I'm looking forward to that for all of you and very excited. So some things that I wanted to help you with, maybe you've probably heard this before already, but just some resources and things to think about while you're preparing to go into your rotations. The first one is uh, get used to being uncomfortable. You're not going to know everything. They can't teach you everything in 10 years, and let alone two. So just be used to that. So it's just something you just have to get used to. I know my first year as a nurse practitioner, I thought I was ready. I was confident. I had been a nurse for a very long time. I was thinking I would just, I was going to kill it. But uh, that's not exactly what happened. Uh, what was that phrase? Tahamokon. A lot of that. A lot of that my first year. So just, just be prepared for that, okay? And that's, and that's okay. That's kind of the expectation. You're not going out there when you finish this program, when you finish your studies here, you're not the expert, you're the novice. So remember that. That leads me to my next point. Be kind to yourself. No one's going to beat yourself up harder than you. And if you don't have the plan or always the right answer, that is also okay. You know, lean on your colleagues, lean on your senior members, your physicians, the other PAs, the other NPs that you work with. Ask the nurses, ask the staff, ask everybody. Be a sponge, soak everything up that you can, and be humble, because at the end of the day, you're there to serve your patients. And whatever you can do to give them the best care is what they deserve. Um, my next point I wanted to talk to you about was discipline. I remember after finishing, oh, didactic, I was so done studying. And I was ready to just do hands-on stuff. That was probably the worst decision I ever made. Coming into clinic unprepared, not having a good study habit and maintaining discipline and studying every day really set me back behind the eight ball. And then you're not gonna feel that embarrassment or that feeling of being underprepared until you're sitting there talking to your patient and you have no idea what to tell them about what's going on with them. So maintain that discipline and don't, don't ease up. This is time to kind of kick on the afterburners. Stay disciplined, continue your studies, and stay prepared. And uh, the last part I just wanted to leave you with is trust the process. You are going through a transformation right now. You are not the same person you were at the beginning of this program, and you're not going to be the same person in one year's time, and you will not be the same person after your first year of practice. I can guarantee it. It is a growing experience. It is painful. It hurts. But then you just have to ask yourself, who is the person that you want to become? Because remember, you all chose to come here. You all chose to become providers. And that's something you cannot lose sight of. Dr. Pearl said, play the long game. And with that, I think uh, we can start doing the white coats. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'd now like to invite FNP Assistant Professor Gordon Worley to join me on stage for the coding. Thank you, Dr. Sexton. So let's get started. Andy Billings. Say he Choi. Anna Cole.
Maria Rosario de Vega. Isabella Dos Santos. Annalise Eastman. Elisa Garcia. Araceli Gutierrez. Kristen Jordy. Sandra Camba. Marissa Counts. Anna Menziuk. Plexades Mataba. Emily Maori. Win Tao Win. Anna Jasmine Perdomo. <laughs> Jennifer Stein. <laughs> Chardelaine Whitlock. and Miter Zhang. Congratulations, FNPs. Uh, now I'd like to invite Dean Kavanaugh back up for a few parting words. Well, congratulations to all of you. Our goal here at uh, UC Davis is to develop providers who are pre prepared to deliver care in all areas where it's most needed, uh, thus expanding access to care, which is one of the greatest challenges both this state and the nation has, getting more people into care, care that's timely, affordable, but also of high quality. You're actually central to all of that work. We are committed to develop clinicians who are prepared to work as members and leaders of healthcare teams. It's one of the reasons why we have PAs and NPs working along nursing students and medical students to build that notion of teamwork and collaboration. And team-based care is one of the new ways of looking forward to, uh, and delivering medicine in the future. It also uh, gives you an opportunity to share ideas with each other, but also you all have a remarkable opportunity right now to lead and bring about change. But bringing about change requires you to be 
careful in how you work with people, to build your commitment, but also to think about the wider societal aspects of care. Remember, this is all about health equity as much as possible. UC Davis is preparing you not only to be part of the changing roles of healthcare, but also we look to you to lead them. We can't wait to see, for example, uh, how much your careers grow, develop, and you become really the healthcare leaders I think you want to be. Come tell us your stories. We want to hear about them. Uh, and we look forward to you to really meeting all your goals and aspirations over the next year and beyond. At this point, I want to say congratulations again and to wish all of you a very good evening. And this concludes our ceremony. Congratulations and well done.